God, you love us so much you gave your only begotten son. Jesus, you gave up all of heaven to die a horrible death on a tree because you loved us that much. So today, God, that is our declaration, that is our request is that you will come, Holy Spirit, and fill this place. The dry bones of yesterday Make them again into a new army. They will rise up and stand upon the word of God. Lord, those watching online right now, Lord, they they wanted to lay it down, but they feel like because the separation from the building, they're being hindered. But God, right now, Lord, I speak to every any listening. God, those present, those watching online. God, that right now in the name of Jesus, you are where they are. Lord, the altar is laid out before them. God, that there's no, there's no place that they could go to escape your love. Your ear is not too heavy that it cannot hear. Nor is your arm too short that it cannot reach. But God, you will go with us even into the ends of this earth. So God, I pray right now for strength and for boldness to fall upon your people. That we will rise up boldly but humbly. God, that we will rise up in strength but with humility. God, that we will rise up as servants wearing kingdom's garment, armor. God, I'm asking you right now. Resurrect our vision. Bring the pieces back together. Give us joy. Give us peace. Give us hope. Give us long suffering. And above all those things, Lord, give us love. Love for one another. Lord, let us break down every wall of division. And let us stand wholeheartedly on your word. Because you died that all men might be saved. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Will you put your hands together for King Jesus one more time all over the house? As I say all, all, every week, these altars are always open. You stay on these altars as long as you need to. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful for clarification, that, that stamp of approval you get from God sometimes because of what other people in their obedience do. And I haven't discussed with Sister Jamie anything that I'm preaching today. And we, when we went into Bible study this morning, we was going over my sermon. She didn't even know it. I want to talk to you this morning for a few minutes on the subject, channeling your focus. Channeling your focus. How many understand and believe it is important that we keep our eyes focused on the prize? The day that not just I make it to heaven, because to me that's, that's not the full prize, but the day that I step into eternity and I see multitudes stepping in with me because we were obedient people. We've been talking about the temple and the altar of incense is mentioned in Revelation. That sweet smelling savor to the nostrils of God is in heaven. And the Bible says there was voices crying out under the altar. We're not at that point in revelations yet. But what happened to the voices crying on the altar? I'm thankful this morning was a was an example of what every service ought to produce. Does that mean the same people need to come down to the altar every week? Does that mean that if we have less people at the altar, we've done something wrong? That's not what I'm saying. But what I am telling you is the more time we spend on these altars. I heard it said like this. 
the more time you spend on an altar, the more alterations you'll have to your life. An altar will alter your life. It will shift your focus. You cannot rely on your own intellect. I shared this Wednesday night, and a lot of times you get crazy looks at you, especially if you're talking to folks been in church their whole life. But it is impossible for me and any of you to know the will of God. We can't do it. Our nature is to always revert back to the will of the flesh. That's why we must crucify the flesh daily. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. And let me go ahead and check this block off. It's free, no charge. It's not part of my sermon this morning, but I'm going to give it to you free. Coming to an altar and giving your heart to Jesus doesn't fill you with the Holy Ghost. It gives you the Holy Spirit. You receive the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. But see, there's a difference between receiving the Holy Spirit, having Him on the inside of you, and then being filled, being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So, Brother Josh, what, how does that, what's the difference? If I take this bottle of oil and I drink it, then I have filled my belly. I have filled my insides with the anointing. But if I take this bottle of oil and I pour it over my head, what I have on the inside is now recognizable on the outside. In other words, if you've truly been baptized with the Holy Spirit, the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit ought to be manifested on your outside. And does that mean that, well, Brother Josh, I haven't spoken in tongues. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 gives you 12 gifts of the Holy Spirit. There's more, but they all fall under those nine. I'm sorry, not 12, nine. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. But there is always a place in the church now I have a slight different approach to the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I would never stand against my authority. And I am in full agreement that the initial evidence of, of, of being baptized with the Holy Ghost is speaking in another tongue. But can I tell you that the, the, the only difference I believe is that it is an initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It is not the initial evidence. But with that being said, don't let me persuade you into believing you are not meant to speak in tongues. Because Paul said, I wish you would all speak in tongues. You know, uh, people that don't speak in tongues, they like to use Paul's words when he says, I'd rather you speak five words I can understand than thousands I can't understand. Is the same Paul that said, I speak in tongues more than you all, and I wish you would all speak in tongues. Understanding tongues is why we get the misinterpretation. See, there's a, there's a time in the service when the Holy Spirit has to say something, but I can't speak God's language because I don't know the will of God. I have to rely on the Holy Spirit who knows the will of God. And the only way I can operate and know the will of God is I must trust wholly and faithfully in the Holy Spirit who knows the will of God. And when God wants to say something straight from heaven, He's going to do so through His Holy Spirit, which is going to come in a tongue of heaven, not of man. And that's when you're going to get the interpretation. I'm giving you a small teaching right here and we're gonna, I'm going to preach a, a short sermon without the short part. But there's moments you come to this altar and the Holy Spirit wants you to pray for yourself, pray for somebody or pray for a situation. You don't know the situation. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what kept them up all night contemplating whether they should live or die. You don't know what kept them out all night drinking and partying and doing drugs trying to hide a scar and a pain that is somewhere deep in their roots that somebody scarred them years ago. You don't know what's going through their heart and through their mind but you was called to pray for them. How can I pray for them and I don't know what's going on with them? I use the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit knows God's will. God's will knows the intentions of their heart. So if I will let the Holy Spirit pray through me with groanings that 
cannot be uttered. I'm going to begin to speak of those things. That's why I say it's important that you never let someone persuade you. I never want someone in leadership around me that says that tongues is not an important part of your life. It's not the ends me. It doesn't mean you're not saved because you haven't spoken in tongues. It doesn't mean that you're not baptized with the Holy Ghost because you've not spoken in tongues. But what I'm telling you is is if if you let the Holy Spirit come into your life, you are going to produce, produce gifts. The Bible says he will withhold no good gift from his children who ask for it. He said if you desire any good thing, the Lord will give it to you. If the Father on earth knows how to give good gifts to his children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who love him? I'm not a better father than my God, but I know that if my children need something for their schoolwork, or if my children need something for, for their health, I'll do whatever I have to do to get it. You think God wouldn't do the same that if you, if you, if you feel the need and you feel the calling to pray for people and you feel the need to go in instead of walking up in people's face and I need to know everything about you before I pray for you and I want you to tell me all your business, just go up there and let the Holy Spirit pray. And you're going to see a whole lot more people get touched and you don't have to know their business and they're not going to feel as guilty and ashamed to come back to church. Because they didn't have to tell the whole world their business. And there's things that I would tell you today, but when I first got saved, I would never want to share. It was embarrassing to know that I used to be that guy. To know that I used to have those feelings. To know that I used to be that careless. I'm so thankful that when the Holy Spirit touched me at an altar that day, when I gave my heart and soul to Jesus Christ, and He baptized me with the Holy Spirit, that I began to confess and I began to pray. But nobody around me, including my adversary, could understand what I was getting out of my soul, what I was getting at. So when He brought back those weapons, He realized, what happened to the sword I left here? What happened to the dagger I left in His heart? When I confessed, God removed it and He he changed it and gave me a new vessel. Channeling your focus is important that you keep your eyes on the prize. Real quick in Scripture, go with me to the book of John chapter 3, verse 22 through 36. I'm going to read all of this, but there's only one Scripture that I'm going to keep throughout this whole sermon. If you will, please stand for the reading of God's holy word, and we'll pray and we'll have you be seated. And then if you stand after that, we either close or God then got in you and you're ready to go. And I'm okay with that, praise the Lord. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Anon near Salem. Because there was much water there. And they came and they were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. And then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ. John stopped him real quick. He said, Remember, I told you, I wasn't the Christ. Don't come trying to stir division. When I started off telling you I wasn't Christ, I was not your Savior. I was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I was just a voice. I was an angel of the Lord for you because I was preparing the way of the Lord. He said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This, my joy, therefore is fulfilled. John said, you telling me this means I'm happy because I was the best man at the wedding of Jesus Christ and the church. I get to stand beside the Lord and my Savior knowing he's already starting the church over there in that river. I'm not offended. I am blessed and I am full of joy. Why, John, why? This is why. He must increase. But, somebody read this for me. I must decrease. He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. 
And what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. Now the scripture says no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit, right? When you learn to know that and you learn to believe that, you have set the seal. For, the, for he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. In other words, he don't say, here's a little bit for you and here's a little bit for you. He doesn't give by measure. When you have received him, you get all of him. You either get all of God or none of God. You don't, you don't get a lukewarm God. You don't be a lukewarm warm child. You're either all of God's or you're none of God's. You're either all of his or you're all of the earth's. Amen. But you've got to choose this day whom you will serve, Joshua said. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The Father loveth the Son and hath given all things into his hand. This is awesome because if you hadn't been in the Bible study, my dad shared in Revelation when he seen, when John on the island of Patmos seen Jesus standing amongst the seven candlesticks, the Bible says there were stars in his right hand and those stars were the angels of the church. The word angel means messenger of God, which means it wasn't, it wasn't the, the angels in heaven, it was the ministers of God, the pastors of those churches, the leaders of those movements. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Will you stretch your hands this way, and I stretch my hands towards you. Will you pray? Father God, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you, Lord, that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Come, Holy Spirit, fill my mouth with your words, God. Speak to these people the things that they need to hear. For I know not what they have need of this day, God. But you do. So we wholly and fully trust in you, God. I am nothing without you but an empty vessel. But with you I can do all things through you. Let me decrease this day, Lord. So that you might increase. We'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, the church says, Amen. I want to jump right into this. I don't want to keep you very long. Um, Don't forget, please, at 2 o'clock, be praying for... The family of Sister Elaine Baggett and uh, Sister Sharon, her husband, passed away this, this past week. and uh, It's been a long battle, a long journey, but they'll be laying him to rest. They're giving him a full military honors funeral, so um, I'm going to go support that. So you know you won't be here at least at 2 o'clock. Amen. But keep them in your prayers. But I, I just I want to I in, in, introduce you something. I want to make just two points for you this morning, but i got to give you a, a, a good, solid foundation. In the 18th century, there was a pioneer of missional theology. His name was Nicholas Zinzerdorf. And he once said this, and it went to be a very popular statement. He said, preach the gospel. Die and be forgotten. Preach the gospel. Die and be forgotten. He wasn't saying it like there's a catch at the end. He was telling us to preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. The reason he's doing this is because he's accurately describing the posture of a missional leader. And in order to understand that, I want to give you the definition of a missional leader. A missional leader is someone that sees what God is doing because we understand that God is always doing something in us and around us. Whether you're aware of it or whether you're not, God is always moving in and around each and every one of us. A missional leader is someone that sees what God is doing. Here's the catch. And becomes a participant in what he is doing. That's a missional leader. A mission minded person. And it's very important that our participation be coherent with the way in which God does his work. See there's a lot of people that know that God is doing something. They want to be a part of it. So they come in with this takeover mentality. Like I know what God wants. So this is what we got to buy. This is what we got to have. This is what we got to paint. This is what we got to decorate. This is the places we got to go. These are the kind of people we want to reach. We want to make sure we get the rich ones. We ain't worried about the poor ones. They don't, they don't do us any good. We want to make sure we get the, 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 the governments. We want to make sure we get these people. So it just makes our name go great and wonderful because God wants to give us a platform we can reach thousands, right? See, a lot of times preachers are salesmen. They talk so fast before you can respond to one thing, they insert 50 other things and then they end with saying because we're going to reach a multitude like this. And then how are you going to argue with someone that says we're going to reach a multitude? So what happens is the church gets silent, the church doesn't stand up, the church doesn't hold them accountable, and the church doesn't say anything. But what you get is a Jezebel trying to establish a kingdom instead of a minister of the gospel trying to establish the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, 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 Whatever his name is, 
uh, Zizendorf was saying is you were called to preach the gospel. So preach the gospel. But you don't get an eternal life in this earth. So you're going to die. When you die, die. Be forgotten. If you are spending your whole time trying to leave a legacy of who you were, I want them to know that I created this church. I built this church. I'm the one that got these people saved. I'm the one that done this. I'm the one that wrote them books. Uh, you are building. You are taking the glory of God. And what you are doing is when you leave the church, when you die or you move on down the road or they give you the boot, the people that were connected to your legacy leave with you. They die with you and they don't go on doing their thing. But when you connect them, if, if you understand you're just a road sign, on the way to Jesus Christ. When they pass by Josh Toomey in Northwoods Church at 640 Hall Road, what they ought to see is Jesus right ahead. They shouldn't see Josh Toomey is where you need to be. They shouldn't believe that my phone calls are going to make your life. If I show up at your funeral, it's out of respect. It isn't because I got the power to get you to heaven. If I show up at your wedding, it's because the state has given me authority to join the bond, but it is God who got the, who's got the covenant with you and your marriage. Once the wedding's over with, I'm going to my house with my bride. Amen? Jesus will stay in your marriage if you let him. Jesus will hold your marriage together like glue, like a bond if you let him. But so many people are losing the bond because they're stuck in the legacies of who they are and they have the takeover mentality. I know God's doing it, but I got to make it happen. And that's the, that's the reason we found ourselves stepping in the hockey of the world today, if you can let me say that. We don't God's not looking for a takeover and do whatever comes into your minds to do. And I'm going to show you in Bible scripture here in just a moment how that works. Rather, we are to learn to participate in God's work in God's way. And we will ultimately understand God's way by looking at the way Christ went above and done his work. So before I can do that, we got to, I need you to understand that a missional leader is someone that is kenotic or kenotic and cruciform. Everybody knows what that means, right? Y'all are better than me. I didn't, so I had to look it up. Amen. Cruciform means formed by the cross. Leadership according to the pattern of Jesus. If you are in leadership according to the pattern of Jesus, not Rick Warren, not John Maxwell, and those are great men, great leaders that can help you in your business, they can help you, they can even help you in your ministry. But they don't have the full capacity to do what needs to be done in your life to be a Christ-like leader. To truly go by the model of leadership according to the pattern of Jesus, the number one thing you have to have is death. You've got to die to yourself. You've got, you've got to die to yourself for the sake of others. Now that doesn't mean you learn to just let people walk all over you. Oh, I'm a Christian, so I gotta let them call me names. I gotta do this and I gotta let them have their way because if I fight against them, they're gonna fight. You know, we, we run into these little barriers along the way in any ministry that you go to. You're hitting your head against the wall with some people. You gotta learn how to love those people and sometimes you gotta work around those people, but never are we to just sit there and say, you don't belong in the kingdom of God because you don't see it like I see it. And that's what you have today is you have so many people feeling guilty because their style of ministry is different than your style. You, they're, they're, and I remember, I want you to keep telling yourself, every time you forget, I want you to remind yourself, channeling my focus, channeling my focus. I'm, I'm supposed to be channeling my focus this morning. He must be taking me somewhere where it's important to channel your focus. I'm going to show you. Channeling your focus is important because if you don't channel your focus, your focus gets bluer when you start looking at everything that needs to be done. When your focus isn't God, everything else takes precedence. So we know what cruciform means, formed by the cross. Kenotic or kenotic means self-emptying. You can go, I'm not going to read them to you, but you can go to Philippians chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 if you want to go read up on being a, a self-emptying leader. Our cruciform participation in the work of God is not self-condemnation. It's not an abdication of authority, but it is self-emptying in order that we can be filled with God and the Holy Spirit for the sake of others. How many times have you desired a move of God in your life, not because you need him to do something in your life, but because you are stepping in the gap for other people's sake? Man, if we had that in the world today, we wouldn't have 
the hatred. We wouldn't have the division. We wouldn't have the separation from this and that. We would be a loving, unified people. Amen. In our Bible study this morning, we talked about how David wanted to build a temple because he said, here I am living in a house of cedar. I'm living in all this beauty and all this riches, and here I got God dwelling in a tent. Let's build for him a house. And then God sent a word through the prophet. He said, David, uh, I'm going to make your name great, but you can't build me a house because there's division, there's disunity and I don't want to dwell in a house of division and disunity. I don't care what kind of wood you build. I don't care what kind of lights you have. I don't care what kind of events you put on. I don't care what kind of classes you have. If it's disunity, I don't want to dwell there. So the focus has to be unity. We have to get we have to come together. God is not a, he is a mathematician but he hates division. He is a God of multiplication. Give him two fish and five loaves he'll multiply it for a thousand. Amen. You give him a couple of coins, he'll make it enough to pay the taxes. You give in three days he'll save the world you just do whatever he can multiply it he can push it he can make a little nothing but when it comes to your life you've got to walk like Christ are we Christians in here is everybody Christian okay we, we, all right I didn't ask was you saved now I asked was you a Christian all right we're gonna find out the only way to be filled with God is to be emptied of yourself but God, I'm David. I'm the king of Israel. I should be the one responsible for building your temple. He said, David, I've given you responsibility. I need you killing the enemy. I need you putting them. But your hands have waged war. Your hands have shed blood. So through your seed, I will build a temple for, that I will dwell in. But until the unity, David, I'm giving you the responsibility of getting rid of the unity. Disunity. And bringing unity. Solomon will build the temple. But it goes even deeper than that. Do you realize there's a messianic prophecy there? The Bible says in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 3, that Jesus is the offspring of David. He said, I will tear the temple down in three days. In three days, I will rebuild it. Jesus, the only pure and holy person to ever walk this land, was the offspring of David that would truly build the temple of God the way it was supposed to be built. What does it look like? You want me to tell you what it looks like? Look in the mirror. You and I, our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He said, and I will destroy those who defile the temple. That's why it is important that you do not let the laws of man remove you from the law of God. You should stand on the law of God even if it costs you your life with the law of man. Even if it costs you your freedom with the law of man. Stand on the word of God because once you start a body into the laws of man that defile the laws of God, you have become an enemy to God. But brother Josh, doesn't the Bible say that we are supposed to abide by the laws of the land? Listen, you've got to understand when this Bible was being written, when God was inspiring these people and these men ministers were, were doing it, God was developing a church that operated in government. But we've come to a day where church and state are separated. But church and state are only separated when it applies to what we have need of. But when it comes to what they can rule over in our churches, then government puts us back in the pot again and they start trying to control what we can preach what we can say where we can who we can hire and, and, and where we can go and at the end of the day we've, 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 we fall under a gavel of man and the Bible says in the last days you know who their voices are crying under the altar of incense it is the people that died for Christ's name's sake because they would not accept changing the laws of this Bible well brother Josh what are we going to do when when a sinner comes in and are we just going to let them leave it's not God's will that any should perish. But the way that leadeth unto destruction is broad, and many there be that find it. In other words, Jesus doesn't change his ways so that the sinner will feel better in his place. He changes the sinner so the sinner will fit the mode of the identity that Jesus purchased with his blood. He said, I'm making you an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. He didn't say I was going to change the furniture, change the paint on the walls, put you in a television that you like up, and make you feel comfortable. He said that there will be great persecution for the believer. He said, because they persecuted me and no servant is greater than his master. If you're not ready to be persecuted for Christ's sake, how can you say that I am Christian? Channeling your focus. You realize you can be saved and not be a Christian? Because the only thing it takes for me to be saved is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
what he did on Calvary's cross. If they put the blood over the doorpost in Egypt, they were saved, right? But if they didn't go on with the rest of the instructions, they were still in bondage. In other words, they would have still been Egyptian slaves instead of born again people. Born out of Egypt into the promised land of Israel. You can be saved and still be an Egyptian slave. It's not because God couldn't do it. It's because you didn't finish the process. Eat the whole lamb. Eat it all. Pack your bags. And in the morning, I want you to hit the dusty trail. And when Pharaoh comes running after you, I've got a cloud by day and a fire by night. He won't get to you when you get your backs against the waters and you know you got to do something, but you don't know what to do because there's nowhere to go. Listen to God and he'll direct your path. Even if he has to walk you across the bottom of the sea, he will get you to where you need to go. As long as our flesh is trying to get its needs met apart from God, we cannot lead people in the way of Christ. In other words, I have goals. See, there's a difference between goals and vision. I have goals for Northwoods Church. I have goals that we've accomplished, and I have goals we've yet to even start moving towards. I believe that a good leader is a goal-oriented person. I don't believe you just get satisfied where you're at. I don't believe you just say, well, it's been working this long. We'll keep it going. Because at some point, when it stops working, what's your plan now? You should always be a progressing people. You should always be, and that's in church business everywhere you go. Things have to change. Things have to develop. I mean, you're living in a day now where you try to pay bills with check. People won't even take them. They're forcing you into online payments. Things like that. They're progressing. And Online payments is not the devil. So if you do it, you do it. If you don't, you don't. I personally don't like it. I've had my card compromised multiple times. But I'm just saying the world moves forward. And, and people move forward. There's some things you can move forward with and you're not stepping away from God. But the difference between goals and visions is when the vision is at hand and my goals are keeping us from reaching it because my goals are affecting people. I've got to set my goals aside and say the vision is still the focus. The mission of the church is still the focus. Are people getting saved? Are people being sanctified? Are people being filled with the Holy Ghost? If they're not, we need to change something. We need to fix something. We need to correct something and channel our focus back to the Great Commission that says go into all nations, teaching them my commandments, baptizing them in the the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit because that is the only way the church is truly going to grow. You can get 10,000 people in the seats. It don't mean you got 10,000 people ready to go to heaven. Amen. I would rather get 10 people focused on God, focused on the mission at hand, and let's march out into the battlefield and wage war because sometimes you and me like Gideon, you would rather get the 300 than the multitude because God's blessed the 300, but the multitude doesn't have the protection of God. Amen. When the, when the, when the enemy surrounded Elijah, what did, the, what did the servant say? Master, we're surrounded. What are we going to do? Elijah said, Lord, let him see. And he opens his eyes and the Bible said he looked up. And I like the picture they in a big mountain valley and just stars and sparkle and fire just raining in the heavens of angels with their swords drawn saying, let them move. And I got you. See, when you are under the will of God, you might not have the multitude of support. When you are under, and I'm telling you, you're living in the day when you stand on the word of God. Mega churches won't be mega churches if the way, if the world keeps going because the only, unless they bow to man, you are going to have to allow offenses to be in perspective of people. We're living in a day where the preacher can't put it in the right words without getting away from the truth. If the Bible says it is a sin, it is a sin. And there's more than one sin. There's more than one abomination, believe it or not. We all know one abomination. And listen, it's an abomination. It's going to stay an abomination. It's, I'm not going to change it. It's going to be an abomination. But you know what else is an abomination? We see it in church every Sunday. And we don't kick it out. Gossip is an abomination. The Bible says there are seven things which God hates, six words are an abomination. A lying tongue, a deceitful heart, one the hands that shed innocent blood, feet that run quick to mischief, things that we are losing our focus because we're trying to control one area of a minute battle when the entire war is being waged. One war doesn't win the battle. You can lose a battle and still win the war if you are strategic. You've got to be smart. You've got to be wise as a serpent, harmless 
as a dove. So you defeat the enemy with the mind of Christ, not with how much you can burn your mouth and how many people you can offend. See, that's the mentality. We talked about that this morning. When God told, told David, when he was talking to David, he was talking to Joab, he said, I want you to act like a man. What's a man act like? Let's go to book of Corinth, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, I think, 13 maybe. Don't quote me on that. Paul said, when I was a child, I spake like a child. I understood like a child. I thought like a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Let me tell you, let me show you what that looks like. When I don't like you for whatever reason, you don't act like me, you don't look like me, you don't talk like me, you don't preach like me, you don't sing like me, you don't like the music that I like, you don't like the, the, the car I drive. And, and when I was a child, I began to talk about you because you didn't like me the way I like things. So when I, I began to understand you as my enemy, when really, we were just two vessels meant for one purpose. When I was thinking, I was thinking of you as attacking me because you didn't have the same likes I like. So you know what I would do? I would put my hands together. I would sit on a pew and I would say, move me if you can, Lord. Welcome to church. I look at my child, my children, and I hear them go outside and kick a ball, and they're going out there to play soccer. Now, my, my mind, soccer is you kick a ball into a net. Shouldn't be nothing else to it. But they'll come in the house, and he changed the rules, and he's not letting me kick it, and I'll kick it into the net. He told me the point didn't count, and, and that did. when I was a child, I spake like a child. I understood like a child. I thought like a child. So we, to this day, we got 10-year-old children, 5-year-old children in church, but we also got 40-year-old children and 50-year-old children and 60-year-old children in church. They still mad at people because they look different. They still mad at people because they act different. They still mad at people. They still so caught up in what granddaddy did that they got to be like granddaddy more than they got to be like God. Are you Christian? Or are you just saved? Self-emptying. <clears throat> so I got these two points I want to give you, and I'm going to get out your face. Our focus after salvation should to become Christian. But you know what being a Christian is? Being Christ-like. See, there's a lot of people that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. But they would rather remove themselves from people because they can't get over their differences. They would rather, rather remove their relationships and remove their church attendance and remove their uh, Bible studies and remove this because of their differences. And how can you say that you are Christ-like when Christ dwelt among sinners? How can you say that you are Christian, Christ-like when Christ had compassion on the broken and the sick in the communities that needed him. How can you say that you are Christ-like when the laws of man said that you can't do this on the Sabbath day and Christ said, let me show you a New Testament. How can you say that you are Christian or Christ-like when everything that changes out of a fear of what you may be having to face afterwards so many people let go of the range and just say, I'm not going to do it because that's the world's definition of being a man. The world's definition of being a man is I'm hard. I'm, ba I'm bad around the corner. Let me tell you, there's always a man better than you. I learned that a long time ago. There's always a man better than you. Amen. And sometimes they don't look like they're better than you until they show you they're better than you. But they're better than you. What am I trying to tell you? That to be a man in the world, don't show your emotion. Don't show your weakness. The world will feed off of it. That's, you know, that's... that's that's world leadership classes. Don't show them you're weak. Don't show them you're, what hurts you. So in other words, I must become an old, bitter, grumpy person to be a man. I must be someone that can find no joy in nothing because I might expose my weakness. But a godly man says, Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. I know you struggle. I know you're broken. I know you feel like you've been mistreated. I'm here to 
to fix your bandages. I too was wounded for your transgressions. I too wore a crown. I too was mocked in spirit. I was like a lamb led to the slaughter where, ever, where the worldly men would have bucked up and tried to show how bad they was and fight the Pharisees. I just went like a lamb led to the slaughter. I never opened my mouth. Only time I opened my mouth is when it needed power to be inserted. And when I inserted power, I made Pilate second guess himself. When he said, what kingdom are you come from? Why are you doing this? If you're a king, stop what you're doing. He said, if my kingdom was here, you wouldn't be doing what you was doing. He said, they said, you call yourself a king. Why won't you stop this? Why won't you do this? Why, what are you doing? He said, do you realize I have the power to crucify you? He said, the only power given to you is from my father in heaven. And if he only knew Jesus was taken in the back of his mind, I got power to call down legions of angels and destroy this whole world right now. You better be glad I'm letting you talk to me the way you're talking to me. But Jesus was a godly man. He held all that in. He held all that pride back. He held all that temptation to get even real quick. And he let God iron it out. Amen. We don't need celebrities that dictate to us what our ministry should look like. <laughs> we talked about in this temple study. I'm telling you that God has orchestrated this thing. Had no plan. I haven't got with daddy about how he was going to teach on Wednesday night. I didn't get with sister Jamie how she was going to do Bible studies. But these things have went together hand in hand. And that's how it should, that's how it should operate. Is one ministry feeding another ministry. We should never separate ourselves. We can't separate ourselves in the church and be mad because the world separates us. We can't be separate in the church and be, be judgmental in the church and then wonder why the world can't get, the, 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 get with the program. But we talked about Aaron's sons who came and brought strange fire to the altar. Now, I'm a minister of the gospel, and I'm going to tell you something. I hope you don't look bad at me for this. I've been preaching for 12 years, and I have been on the Internet before. I have found quotes from preachers and from ministers on the Internet before. And I've used them in my sermons. I've even listened to sermons preaching, preached by other people. And I've went back and I've prayed and I've studied the same subject, the same topic. Sometimes even using the same scriptures. But I would always let God tell me how to preach it to my congregation. Because I know of two priests that died because they brought somebody else's coals to their altar. When you was told you got to keep the fire burning on your altar, you can't go get somebody else's who's been, who's been killing their fire thinking you can get their fire and bring it to your altar and everything's going to be said and done. You've got to, if you truly got a love for your sheep, you need to find out, God, what do you want to say to my people? Lord, what do you want to say in this place? Well, whoever's going to be here today, God, whether you remember or not, was or not here, God knew he was going to be here and he has something for you. Not because I knew, knew you, not because I, I'm some special agent from the Lord. I'm just a nobody God's using to show that there's a somebody who loves everybody. Amen. I'm just telling you that strange fire will ruin, it, even with good intentions, strange fire will ruin a good intention. Strange fire. They died for bringing strange fire to the altar. Keep the fire burning on your altar. I'm not saying that it's wrong to use a, a quote somebody else said. I just used one in my sermon. But my God, when you print your sermon out and you preach it point by point, there's something wrong with that. And you've got churches everywhere doing it today. They play golf all week. They camp all week. They go out to every restaurant on the face of the planet all week. Come Saturday night, they hit the internet button. They click on sermons about joy print and they go preach a sermon about joy out of somebody else's labor somebody else's hard work somebody else that spent time with the Lord they're out there trying to preach their fire on their altar you better be glad the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is with us than the dispensation of grace because there were people that died for doing that so we should not uh, we should uh, um, leaders shouldn't dictate big churches shouldn't dictate how we're supposed to operate we need to look at what we have need of challenge and channel your focus we don't need trends to which we conform our personality we don't need trends to which how we conform our delivery of our messages we don't need trends to tell us well this is what's going to make us successful I can tell you what's going to make us successful the same thing that made Acts Church successful when the Holy Spirit fell and lame men got up and walked and dumb people spake and blind people opened their eyes and people got saved when a jailer started to kill himself and Paul and Silas said hey wait don't kill yourself the same God that opened my doors is going to save your life if you'll hold on just a little bit longer and the angel's going to save you he's going to save your household too and I'm going to come spend the night with you because we're friends now I'm not coming to spend the night with you guys don't worry our ministry must be formed around the principle of John the Baptist in, the, in, in John chapter 3 verse 30 
He must increase, but I must decrease. When the issue that we have today is churches are being run like businesses. The pastor is now the CEO. The associate pastor is now the executive pastor. And listen, there is a business side to the church. If you don't understand anything about business, you don't apply any business to your church, you can go ahead and get ready to start shutting the doors. Because the church has responsibilities in our government, and in our land. The Bible says give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. That means we don't reject what Caesar gets because we are Holy Ghost filled. So there is a business side to it. But when we enter this room right here, this is the Holy of Holies. This isn't about Caesar. This isn't about the world. This is about people getting free. This is about people getting restored. This is about people getting full of the Holy Ghost. And, and we, can't, we can't go out with a, with a mentality that uh, we got to make sure that everybody's comfortable. Don't get me wrong. Your comfort is important to us as leaders in this church. I want you to sit comfortably. I don't want you to back hurting because you're trying to listen to the whole sermon that the preacher won't hurry up and get to, through with. But I am telling you that your comfort of your Life in sin can't be, can't be something I'm okay with. I don't want to make you comfortable going back out into sin. Which means there's going to be sermons that I have to preach that's going to step on your toes a little bit. But if you let me take my shoes off and show you, the Bible says beautiful are the feet of those that carry the gospel. There is, I promise you that is a spiritual thing because if you ever see these feet, you will know that it is not physically true that the beautiful feet ain't mine. It says beautiful are the feet that those carry the gospel, but I can take my shoes off and show you spiritually my toes are beaten better than bruised before I ever come up here and preach it to you. God steps on me before he ever steps on you with these sermons. We need to approach leadership with a, leadership with a Christ-like humility and pursue the noble labor of gospel ministry. So I want to show you a couple of things that happen when you start losing your focus. Everybody knows Paul is one of the greatest authors in the New Testament. He has an awesome testimony of how he was a persecutor of the church. God struck him down on the road to Damascus, blinded him for three days. Man came out an apostle. He's filling people with the Holy Ghost because of his anointing. He's teaching people. He's preaching people back to life. He's going around and the same people he used to work for hate him. And they're pursuing to kill him because he has turned on the world, the world's way of leadership. And he's turned to a godly way of leadership. So we know Paul to be a great guy. But can I tell you this morning, Paul had two great mistakes in his ministry that we can learn from. Number one, there came a time in Paul's ministry when Paul started trusting his own intellect. See, Paul was a very, very smart man. He was a scholar. He didn't just come out the backwoods of South Georgia working with his daddy on the farm and saying, you know what? I feel like I need to preach. So, um, if you don't mind, Pastor, I'd like to get the microphone next time. I'd like to say a word. No. Saul, whole life, he dedicated under Gamaliel Learning the Old Testament. Learning the laws. If there was a man that could take you, he was above the average knowledge of a Pharisee. He could take you straight to the scrolls and show you where the law, the Levitical law says this, 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 this. This is what Isaiah the prophet said. This is what Jeremiah the prophet said. This is what Micah said. This is what Obadiah said. He could go through the whole thing talking about that. He could take you just like that right there. Scholarly man. A lot of wisdom. But then something happened on the road to Damascus. He gained knowledge he didn't know existed. He gained an experience that he didn't know was out there. He got filled with the Holy Ghost. But in the book of Acts, chapter 17, verse 16 through 34, Paul addresses the Athenians in a very popular sermon we know as the Sermon of Mars Hill. When Paul goes in there, Paul dug into his intellectual prowess. He identified a hook to hang his message on. He preached about Jesus Christ. He preached about the cross. But he was in a debate with man because the Athenians couldn't understand. And he was debating them and he was using his intellect. He was using his knowledge. He was using his wisdom because he was full of it, right? Knowledge is power in the world. But see, the wisdom of God outweighs the knowledge of man. You can't have wisdom and not have knowledge. You can't have knowledge and not gain wisdom. If you don't have them both, they're going to fight you instead of help you. 
Knowledge and wisdom are important. But he had this knowledge, this world knowledge, and, and what he had studied, what he had read, and what he had understood. And he began talking, and the Bible says that he went on to do it. And although that we have held his sermon in high regard, Paul seems to have felt differently about this sermon than we did. We look at Mars Hill, and we speak very highly of it, but if you look at what happened to Paul after that day, Paul changed about how he preached. In most places Paul visited, he turned the city upside down. But in Athens, the Bible teaches us that only a few believed. Only a few believed. So therefore, at his next ministry stop, he went to Corinth. Paul turned from his strategy. He says of this new strategy that he came to them without eloquence or superior wisdom. When he steps on the Corinthian church, the first thing he tells them is, I do not come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but I come by demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Meaning, I'm not here to show you what I know about the world. I'm not here to market your, your church. I'm not here to build your programs. I'm not here to give you all the knowledge and pieces you need to go out and create a successful flow of fun ministries that are going to keep people coming and happy and satisfied. He said, I do not come with that knowledge, but I come with an, I don't come with the enticing words. I'm not here to give you a bunch of a bunch of schooling. I'm here to give you demonstration of the Holy Spirit. I'm here to show you that God has given you a comforter that is greater than any doctor you've ever met. I have showed you that God has given you a healer that can touch where doctors can't reach. I've I've come to show you that there is someone that can fight depression that you can't fight. I've come to show you that there's a person living on the inside of you that knows how to get you out of your financial crisis. I know there's a person on the inside of you that knows you how to rise up and change the injustices of this world. I know there's something on the inside of you that is causing you to rise up and become a leader for this nation and become a leader for the church but you got to know him and I can't teach you about him I'm just going to show you who he is and he done it with demonstration of the Holy Spirit so my first point to you this morning church is if you are leading a ministry without the demonstration of the Holy Spirit change what you are doing we don't mind changing the lights when they look bad we don't mind changing the paint when it looks bad how about we change the way we minister when the, when the power of God isn't falling and the power of God isn't consuming and we, we, we want the Shekinah glory to fall down we got to be willing to get out the way because the Bible says that when they dedicated the temple the smoke filled room was so strong that the priest could not bear to minister Holy Spirit has to preach something on Sundays and you got to let him I'm preaching to me Paul had converts in Athens yet thankfully he could see the potential for more see if we get satisfied with saying well I obeyed the Lord and maybe I was just here for one maybe you was just there for one but what if you could have got two or fifty are you going to be satisfied with saying well at least I got one what we deal to one sinner, we have to deal to all sinners. If you're going to deal grace to someone that isn't abiding by all the rules, deal grace to everyone that is not abiding by all the rules. If you are going to deal, if you are going to require rules upon one, require rules upon them all. Amen. I'm not going to come here. I got my mom and dad in this church. I'm not going to come here and say, Mama, you can do this because you're my mama. But, but Brother Randy, you're going to have to go through this process because, you know, you just got to do it. I can tell you something. I'm not swelling this head up. But I came here four years ago. In three weeks, four years, I've been at Northwood Church. And I came and I tried out. And I watched a man get up here by himself with a guitar and a headset and play a song. And this man's still playing on this stage today. And he's serving. And that's Brother Randy and his family. I'm thankful for them. But you can ask Brother Randy, even in the dedication that he's had, whether it was in children's ministry or with the praise team, he's still got the same requirements on him as the new ones that come in the door. That's what I'm saying. It's challenging and changing and channeling your focus to God. Because I promise you, God doesn't want every piece of the puzzle to look the same. He doesn't want every vessel to be exactly the same. You're going to be different. I'm going to hurry up and shut up. All right. Paul had converts in Athens. Sometimes our successes will hinder us from seeing what God could have done. Have you, ever, have you ever thought about that or, or think about it right now? Have you ever been in a place in your life where you were successful in something, but now looking back, man, I was a successful businessman, but man, my kids really didn't get much of my attention. I was a successful pastor, but man, my discipleship was hard. I was a successful singer, but I didn't do anything but sing other people's songs. And I was a successful intercessor i could pray for people and things would happen but i never could find a way to pray for those closest to me i'm gonna tell you something if you ain't already figured it out 
I can come in this church and I can pray the house down for people I don't even know. And I don't know nothing about. But the hardest thing is for me to get at that house and pray for my family. It is so hard. I don't know why. I can't even tell you why. It is so hard. Maybe that's because of the connection I have to them that I don't have to every other person. There's a, there's a relationship with my wife that no other person in this, this world holds with me. Maybe that's why I pray for them daily, but to lay my hands on them and get in their face and say, I'm praying for you right now. Man, that is the hardest thing to do. That's why I can't trust in my own intellect. I have to rely on the Holy Spirit. God has many talented followers that can attract a following. Hear that? See, God has many attractive followers that can attract a following. One of my favorite singers of all time to this day is Tasha Cobbs. Boy, that woman right there can do it. She's a little bigger. And her voice can bring in the crowds. But in the world, the world of media today is we don't really want to put Tasha Cobbs on the front of a cover. I like Lauren Daigle. We'll throw her out there real quick because she can attract them, attract the followers. And listen, I'm not saying that they don't deserve to be followed. They, they're good people. I mean, maybe you know something about them I don't know. But what I'm getting at is the church has a, a, enough attractive followers that can attract followers. But we need a church full of Holy Ghost filled people that can attract Holy Ghost filled people. Because if we can get the Holy Spirit in the service, he's not looking on the outward appearance of man, but he's bringing forth the anointing that destroys the yokes. And I don't want my child being entertained. I want my child being freed. I don't want my children being held under a standard of this is what right looks like and this is what right doesn't look like. I want my child being directed by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will show him and lead him and guide him. As the praise team, can, if they'll make their way this way at this point, I'm going to give you the final point in closing. See, everything that we think should work for the church is our own intellect. And we can't rely on our own intellect. Because, yeah, we might be getting a few souls here and there. But what if we relied on the Holy Spirit and we could have gotten more? We could have gotten more. Well, Brother Josh, I've just talked to so many people and... They feel uncomfortable when y'all speak in tongues. Okay, that's fine. Don't ask me to change my Pentecostal belief at a Pentecostal church for a non-Pentecostal believer. I can help that person find a church that they can get comfortable until they understand Pentecost. But don't ask me to change the Bible well, Brother Josh, that was just back then for the apostles. That's funny to me because uh, Paul wasn't in the upper room and he spake in tongues more than them all. Paul's conversion was later down the road. And others were filled with the Holy Ghost throughout the New Testament. It is important that we don't think, well, it's just, when, when people get to dance, you, I mean, it's okay. We can come up here and have prayer meetings when they can dance all they want to. But all this dancing and stuff, it, it distracts people. It's foolish. You know what else is foolish? The preaching of the cross is foolish to those that perish. You know what else is foolish? The things the church does because it goes against the grain of man. But my Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So if it's foolishness, praise the Lamb of God because the foolishness of God is even greater than the wisdom of man. Last point I'm going to give you. Paul had two mistakes in his ministry. The first one was he trusted his own intellect, but thankfully he learned from it and he began demonstrating the power of the Holy Spirit over his own intellectual power. The second thing Paul did is Paul began to value goals over relationships. It is important that you have godly relationships. The Bible said when he created all this creation, he got done with the, with the day, he said that is good. He got done with the stars in the sky, that is good. He got done with the water and the land, that is good. He created them a camel, a donkey, a mule, a giraffe, a hippopotamus, and everything else, an eagle. And he said, man, that is good. Then he created a man, he said, it is not good that man should be alone. You women know you put a man by himself, you don't know what you're coming home to. Amen. 
Uh, I got a man that said amen and no women. Praise the Lord for that. <laughs> Paul valued goals over relationships. Relationships are important. The Bible said if one falls, if there's more than one of you and one falls, there's someone there to pick him up. But if a man be by himself and he falls, there's no one there to help him. The Bible says a three-strand cord is not easily broken. He said one is easily overcome, but two is not easily overtaken. Three is not easily overcome. There's power in unity. There's power in growth. Amen. There's power in relationships. See, after the, the successful first missionary tour. Paul and Barnabas went on a missionary tour and they were going from city to city, from country to country, from church to church and they were planting the seeds of the gospel and they were planting the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Paul and Barnabas wanted to start going back to those cities to see how they had grown, to see if they could help maybe take them a little further along. And they had looked at going back to the, the, the cities that they had previously visited. Barnabas wanted to take a man by the name of John Mark. You know, the, the, the gospel writer John. This is him. He wanted to take John Mark. But see, Paul was frustrated with John Mark. Because early in their first missionary tour, they was relying on John Mark. They needed John Mark there. Paul looked at John Mark as being a third leg of that tripod stool. But John Mark, for whatever reason, turned and left them to face the rest of their tour alone. So in Paul's mind, John Mark quit on me. He quit on me. So Barnabas, I don't know what you're doing by asking him to come along, but I'm going to tell you right now, he ain't going with me. I don't need to get out here in a church. I need folks that's going to have my back. And see, I get people all the time as a pastor saying, you know, Brother Josh, I got your back, man. I got your back. But if I'm not here, then they're not here. If I'm not here to cut the grass with them, they're not going to cut the grass. If I'm not here to spray the bushes with them, they're not going to spray the bushes. If I'm not here to, you know, move the stuff out of the closet with them, they're not going to move the stuff out of the closet. That doesn't tell me that you got my back. That tells me you got my front. But when I'm not here, you're not either. And I, if I got folks got my back, I need this church moving forward. If I get taken out today, I need this church moving forward because remember, I must preach the gospel, die and be forgotten. I don't need you remembering who I was and what I've done. I need you remember what Jesus Christ done because that is what we're building this upon. The Bible says, going back to the tongues talking a minute ago, the Bible says that tongues is a sign to the unbeliever. And our mission statement says that we are lifestyle transformational center dedicated to helping the lost back to Christ that means above all other things our priority should be set a service up to reach lost people and if when we get through this let's we will push them to other things but our service should be organized to reach lost people which means I'm going to go ahead and throw this, this, um, this thing in here for you that means you're always going to be changing every service for something because you're reaching lost people and no lost person is lost in the same sin. I can't get up and tell the same testimony of my drug addiction over and over and over and expect people going through divorces to understand my hurt and my pain. I can't stand up and tell the same story of, of my arrest records or my robberies or my, my child abuse to the people that don't go in it. That's why it's important that we be willing to change the service to reach the lost back to Christ. Amen. And when they come back to Christ, we can create in them loving relationships and then we can begin to understand one another. Paul didn't want John Mark to go. John Mark started the first trip with Paul and Barnabas, yet he abandoned them halfway through. Paul refused to have him come, but Barnabas refused to go without him. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. See, Barnabas takes John Mark back to Cypriot cities. But Paul joins with a man named Silas and he heads back to the cities in the interior of Asia Minor. Those are, those are places that John Mark didn't go. So Paul said, well, that's fine. You take John Mark. I'll go with Silas. I'm going to go to the places John Mark quit on us and never went. It was in Paul's first stop on the second trip that he meets up with a man named Timothy. And everything seemed fine, right? Sometimes, because God chooses not to reprimand a sin, does not mean He condones it. Right. See, what Paul was doing was Paul was angry and Paul was bitter towards John Mark. But God didn't strike down His hand from heaven and, and just spank him on his bottom side. He didn't reprimand him immediately. He let him go on his journey. He even gave him another man named Silas. 
And then he runs him into Timothy who would be a great pastor. Just because God doesn't reprimand your sin immediately doesn't mean he condones it. Paul chose not to forgive John Mark and promoted broken relationships in favor of attaining ministry goals. It goes back to this. If you are in a position of being a missionary leader, listen, you don't have to have, you don't have, to have a title to be a missionary leader. That means you know God's doing something and you're willing to participate in it. That's how you become a missional leader. I don't write you a certificate. I don't do anything. You become a missional leader because you recognize God's doing something and you become a participant of it. That's a missional leader. And if you're going to be a missional leader, then it is your responsibility to lead people the way Christ would have them led. But if you start leading people and you're not willing to forgive, you're going to promote unforgiveness in your leadership. If you are leading people but you're not willing to handle things the way the Bible handles it, you're going to get people that don't handle things the way the Bible says to handle it. Paul promoted broken relationships and he started reaping the benefits of broken relationships. He wasn't even aware he was doing this because the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5 and 18 that we are given a ministry of reconciliation. Everybody. You don't even have a choice if you're going to be involved in that ministry. That was given by God when you became his child. You received the ministry of reconciliation. That means it is your job to reconcile those broken relationships. To reconcile. Doesn't mean you've got to condone people. Doesn't mean you've got to go dwell among them. It doesn't mean you've got to go participate in their sin. But as for them thinking you hate them, you need to forgive them. You need to let go and you need to make sure that there's nothing that could be used against you or why they are where they are. Once I offer someone forgiveness, it's out of my hands. That's right. You don't forgive someone because they deserve it. You forgive someone because you deserve it. You don't deserve to live under the bondage of unforgiveness. You don't deserve to live under the bondage of people not not, not knowing who you are capable of being. You don't deserve to live under the bondage of any man because God has made you free. And if God has made you free, you shall be free indeed. Will you stand all over the house this morning? The good news is, is in both these mistakes Paul recognized them and Paul made a change because he was channeling his focus when you get focused on making sure all the business blocks are checked off for the service but doggone it I didn't get to pray this morning I checked off the blocks to say you know we got, I got my cards out and I'm so thankful for our teams because they take a load off that we can prepare. But there's a lot of people out there that you got two or three people in the church that do all the work and they never participate in the spiritual things of the church. I would rather every flavor of Northwoods Church fall through the cracks on a Sunday morning and you be so full of God that when you leave here, your tail smoking. Amen. And when you walk into a restaurant and order your food, they anoint it. They cook it in anointing oil because they just recognize the, the broad instruction of God upon your life. I would rather you leave here so full of God that when you go to drink water, it parts around your face because of the holiness of God. I would rather you be so full of God that when you walk to the hospital to visit your grandma, 17 people on hallway 3 over there and D rooms B331 through 31. Get up off that bed and say, I couldn't hear well, but I can walk again. I couldn't hear, but I hear again. It's because you carry something down that hallway that said, Devil, I bind and rebuke you. I cast you down. Release my children. Release my brothers. Release my sisters. I'd rather know you didn't get a connection card, but you connected to God than to know that everything was set in place and you were still left undone. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Am I saying that they having those things mean we're in the wrong direction? Absolutely not. We have those things because we care that you get associated with us. If you're new here, I want to know about you. I want to know you was here. I want to be able to be able to say, you know what? When I run into this name later, if you never come back again, I want to say, I remember this name coming across my desk and we prayed over it. And I read on here that they had a prayer request and I want to hear a testimony. That's why we do it. So it doesn't, because we have those things, doesn't mean we're doing something wrong. I'm just saying, it's like I told Pastor Ryan yesterday. I just want to make sure that we don't, we don't get those things at the expense of our prayer time. 
I want to make sure we don't get other ministries that operate in the parking lot at the expense of the Holy Spirit. I don't want to give up God to make sure we get a blessing from people. If I have to lose 50% of the congregation to preach the truth, I have to be willing to do that. I have to be willing to do that. Because I will give an account for every vessel that I preach to. I will give an account on your behalf. But you will stand before God for your own account. You, nobody, I won't stand there with you. That's why I'm saying, let me preach the gospel. Let me die. Let me be forgotten. Because when you stand before God, I won't be there with you. And when you stand before God and he says, I noticed in 1935, you got saved. In 1950, you fed a poor man on the street corner. In 1953, you done this, you done this, you done this, and done this. And in your late age of, in 1992, you really had a problem with the man I sent to your church. And you spoke evil things of him. Can you give a record of why? Can you imagine standing before God who knows your heart and your intentions and your thoughts? The Bible says you will give an account for every idle word spoken. Cuss all you want to. Be ready to tell God why you needed to. That's it. Don't apologize to me. If you're willing to cuss in front of me, you do it in front of God every day. Don't let me stop you. Folks like, I don't, I, you a pastor. I'm, I'm sorry, man. I didn't know you was in here. No. Don't mind me. You talking to, you talk to the front of God all the time and you do it. Don't let me stop you. I'm just Josh. Are you willing to channel your focus this morning? Say, I will get, I will get what you have for me, Lord. Lord, right now I'm cleaning my slate. Lord, give me a fresh start right here. You increase, I will decrease. Lord, if I don't have, nobody has to know my name. I don't have to publish a single book. I don't have to write a single song. I don't have to be known for a single sermon. But Lord, if you can use me in this moment right now, use me in this moment to direct your people to you because I don't want to be known. I'm glad you're baptizing people in the water over there because they're not going to get anywhere being baptized by me. They need to be baptized by you. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for doing it. Your focus has to be on pointing people to Christ and not trying to make a stamp of who you are in their memory. Our nature is to drift back to the world. But if our focus remains on Christ alone, we will see His will accomplished in, in and around our lives. You don't have to force anything. You don't have to force anything except. Look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to force anything except. Look at your other, other neighbor because somebody left them out say, you don't have to force anything except yourself to stay focused. In other words, no excuse keeps you from being focused. You can't say, well, I got this and I got this and I got this and I got this and I got this. You don't have to force anything except yourself to stay focused. You don't have to force your neighbor to keep focused. You don't have to force them, their neighbor to keep focused. You don't have to force your children to stay focused. If you will stay focused, other things begin to... You ever, you ever worked a camera, video camera? Sister Haley does it every all the time in her photography. What you put that camera on, it'll come up blurry. And all of a sudden, it starts working things out. And all of a sudden, it clears all the way out. It starts in the middle, and it clears all the way out. If you will stay focused while it's shifting focus, and all those things around you that are still shifting your focus, it's going to start coming out around you, and the whole picture is going to be clear again. Yes. Well, Brother Josh, if I'm doing this and I'm focused, and you know, why does everything keep, keep getting harder and harder? Because Jesus' way of leadership will always cut against the grain of man's leadership. Jesus' way of leadership will always go against man's intellect. That's why we can't focus on our own knowledge and wisdom. So what we're going to do is I'm going to ask them to sing a couple of songs. I'm going to open these altars. we got a baptism this morning. 
So after y'all get done praying, I'm going to ask you just to hang out for a few minutes and be a part of this baptism that says I'm going down with the old and I'm coming up with the new. And I'm so excited for it this morning. But I'm going to turn it back over to the praise team. I'm going to let them sing and worship and praise. And If you've got any need in this house, I know guys are moving these altars this morning, but listen, maybe you should have stepped out then and you didn't. I want to give you a moment to do that. And I'll be happy to pray with you. But my challenge for you this morning is to channel your focus. Amen. Adjust your focus. Stop looking at everything that needs to be done and look at the one thing that done everything. Because if your focus will be on Him, and you will have demonstration of the Holy Spirit. Everything else will come into play. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. These altars are open.